Chronicle of the Times Vintage Voices from 1871 Welcome to Chronicle of the Times and this week's episode of Vintage Voices looking at events and gossip from 1871. In today's episode we take a look at the major headlines that people were talking about, the reader letters requests for help regarding love life and propriety, popular recipes of the time featured in the Queen publication, a popular poem at the time that outlines a bachelor's perfect existence, and short stories from the papers and several scandals of the year. For our listeners, we think there is a real value in looking at history not only for interest and understanding of our past, but also as a bar to see how far we have come. We really hope you enjoy the show. About 1871, we commence today's episode with a quick look at some of the major events of 1871. Charles Dickens has sadly died the year before, Queen Victoria has reigned for 34 years, Prince Albert has been dead some 10 years. Abraham Lincoln was assassinated six years before. Lewis Carroll publishes Alice's Adventures Through the Looking Glass, which he wrote in between his many visits to the local pub with his good friend J.R.R. R. Tolkien. The Royal Albert Hall is opened by Queen Victoria and incorporates the world's largest organ at the time. The London-Australia Telegraph Cable connects London to Darwin. Scottish explorer Dr Livingstone is found by Welsh journalist Henry Morton Stanley near Lake Tanganyika and recounts the immortal words in his writings, at Dr Livingstone, I presume. The Great Chicago Fire takes place annihilating parts of the Windy City some 100,000 people lose their homes. The first Major League Baseball game takes place. The start of the standardization of having criminals photographed, what becomes mugshots, is begun. At the start of 1871, Queen Victoria is in her 34th year as reigning mon monarch of Great Britain. William Ewart Gladstone is Prime Minister of Great Britain and Ulysses S. Grant is President of the United States. Somerset Lowry Corrie, the fourth Earl of Belmore, is the Governor of New South Wales. What people are talking about. The marriage of Princess Louise to an English nobleman. Princess Louise, fourth daughter of Queen Victoria, is to marry John Campbell, the Duke of Argyle, Marquess of Lorne. It is a supposed love match between the two. It is all the more exciting in that the Princess Louise is marrying a nobleman rather than a foreign prince, as would be the norm. Interestingly, her brother, the Prince of Wales, opposed the marriage. Possibly his opposition helped Princess Louise's cause as Queen Victoria swooped in and made it so. The Tichborne case. This outrageous case sees a former butcher who moved to Australia due to his many debts pretend to be the long-lost heir Roger Tichborne, who was believed to have been lost somewhere around in Australia. The case went on for years and years, primarily as the mother of the long-lost heir, unable to accept the loss of her son, immediately agreed that Arthur Orton was indeed her lost son, Sir Roger Tichborne, although they looked nothing alike. Everyone had an opinion on the case, including Charles Dickens. The Bolton and Park Scandal Everyone is talking about the scandalous Bolton and Park trial. Both men are charged with the serious crime of intimate relations with another male, spurring others to do the same, and outraging the public 
by their flagrant wearing of women's clothing. It is even rumoured that one of the men would entice other men to lewd acts dressed as a woman, and that he was so successful that it was not distinguishable that he was actually a man. The Bayswater Tragedy Frederick Moon, the son of Sir Francis Moon, a baronet, has been found stabbed to death by Mrs. Flora Davy, also known as Hannah Newington. It would appear that the two had had a long-term relationship in which Mr. Moon supported Mrs. Davy. However, it transpires she is already married, possibly bigamously. Mr. Moon is found dead on the floor, with Mrs. Davy explaining the accidental nature of his having been stabbed. The case is watched with all eagerness. The baronet, Sir Francis Moon, is bereft at the loss of his son and the scandal upon the family. The Eltham Murder Pretty maid, Maria Coulson, is found battered to such an extent that the bone above her eye is described as utterly fragmented, with her brains protruding out. The forlorn dark road where she is found is a perfect spot for murder, but Jane has excitedly told many who she was to meet, the son of her last employer, who she has been romantically involved with for the last several months. Indeed, pregnant Jane was dismissed from her position due to her condition. The family are exceedingly wealthy with close ties to the newspapers. Will Jane receive justice in the hands of the court? The case is watched closely by all. The serial killer child Agnes Norman, a 15-year-old child who leaves a trail of death wherever she goes to light. Pets, children, infants, none survive when Agnes is hired as a childminder and maid. The shocking case goes to trial. Advertisement from the Clerkenwell News, the 12th of December, 1871. Girl wanted, 13 or 14 years of age, for housework and children. Must be clean and respectable, located Shepherdess Walk. Agony Aunt Corner. In today's episode, we look at letters from the Home magazine. Interestingly, the magazine was run by Samuel Beaton, husband of Mrs. Isabella Beaton, famed authoress of the Cook and Household Management, and later remembered for her recipe books. Letter 1. To Minnie. No decent woman ever tempers with matrimonial advertisements. There is no occasion for such to advertise for a husband. It is the refuse of the market which is put up for auction. Letter 2. To Jay's Pussy. We are glad to hear you're only 17, as you appear to have very little idea of propriety. At your age you cannot decide for yourself either write or say very distinctly what we have said and that you are deeply distressed that you have already been so deceitful and disobedient to the parents who trust you. Letter 3 To Country Bumpkin A flirt is one who keeps up a bantering, gesturing, stop-jesting intercourse with men, a sort of undignified and spurious lovemaking, tending to mislead as to her serious intentions, and your handwriting is not yet formed. Letter 4. To Nervous Gertrude. Does your mother know of your engagement to the young man with whom you take walks? And at the same time, do you deceive your mistress? And should she inquire whether you were walking with a fellow servant? Take care to speak the truth. Letter 5. To Scholastica. Does not it seem to take natural attraction into account? Love is given, not bought. She might be very strongly attracted and love another girl very warmly, but that other girl might feel no such natural attraction or love for
for her, nor do we think she could find fault with her for anything so natural over which she had no control. Advertisement from the Queen, the 23rd of September, 1871. Roland's Kaledor, an oriental botanical preparation for improving and beautifying the complexion and skin and eradicating all cutaneous visitations. It eradicates all tan spots, freckles and cutaneous defects and at the same time realising a healthy and purity of complexion. Prices are four shillings and sixpence and eight shillings and sixpence per bottle. General advice. The wish of a bachelor. One, a gentle companion to soften my cares. Two, a thousand a year to conduct my affairs. Three, dogs and a gun to pass away time. Four, horses and chase to convey me and mine. Five, cheerful companions, dash wise, prudent and marry. Six, dishes each day with six glasses of sherry. Seven, beds to accommodate friends at their leisure. And eight, some things or others to add to their pleasure. Nine, pounds in my pocket when cash I require and a passport to heaven, when went from earth I expire. Advertisement from the Yorkshire Post and Leeds Advertiser, 27th of July, 1871. Wanted, immediately by a gentleman in a nervous state of health, a cheerful companion to travel about with him for a few weeks. Good references required. Address, A.B. Post Office, York. Medical advice. This week's medical advice comes from a travelling guide and a letter sent into the English Woman's Domestic Magazine. For those hasty treatments needed by travellers in foreign parts, an emergency emetic. For want of proper physic, drink a charge of gum powder in a tumbler full of warm water or soap suds and tickle the throat with a feather. From the lady from Edinburgh. I have been abroad for the past four years, during which time I left my daughter at a large and fashionable boarding school near London. I sent for her home directly I arrived, and I expected to see a fresh, rosy girl of seventeen come bouncing in to welcome me. What, then, was I supposed to see but a tall, pale young lady glides slowly in with a measured gait and languidly embrace me. When she had removed her mantle, I understood at once what had been mainly instrumental in metamorphosizing my merry romping girl into a pale, fashionable belle. Her waist had been reduced to such absurdly small dimensions that I could easily have clasped it with my two hands. How could you be so foolish, I exclaimed, as to sacrifice your health for the sake of a fashionable figure? Please don't blame me, Mamma. she replied. I assured you I would not have voluntarily submitted to the torture I have suffered for all the admiration in the world. She then told me of how the most merciless system of tight lacing was the rule of the establishment, and how she and her forty or fifty fellow pupils had been daily imprisoned in the vices of whalebones drawn tight by the muscular arms of sturdy waiting mates. The mischief is done. Her muscles have been murdered, and she must submit for life to the to be encased in a stiff panoply of whalebone and steel. And all this for what? Merely to attract admiration for her small waist. I write to you and inform your readers of the system adopted in fashionable boarding schools so that if they do not wish their daughters tortured into wasp waist invalids, they may avoid sending them to schools where the corset screw is an institution 
of the establishment. Advertisement, corset, busks, Thompson's unbreakable by the new patented principle no perforation of the steel is necessary, thus allowing for a much finer temper and entirely obviating the risk of the usual breakage. Vintage Victuals Today's recipes come from the publication The Queen. Mayonnaise Sauce Carefully strain the yolks of four eggs into a basin which you place in a cool place or, if necessary, in water or on ice. Then proceed to pour in a few drops at a time some very good salad oil without ceasing to stir the mixture. When one tablespoon of oil is well incorporated with the yolks of egg, put in the same manner one teaspoonful of French white vinegar. Keep on adding oil and vinegar in these proportions until you have a sauce the consistency of a very thick cream. You now add salt and white pepper to taste, mix them well and the sauce is made. Add to the above a sufficient quantity of the following herbs very finely minced to give the sauce a green colour. Tarragon, chervil and garden cress in equal proportions. Beer olives. Cut thin slices of steak two inches by six. Put on each at one end a piece of well-flavoured pork sausage meat the size of a pigeon's egg. Roll up each olive tightly and neatly and tie it up with a piece of bread. Fry them in very hot butter until they begin to take colour, then take them out. Remove the string from each and lay them by. Fry some onions a gold colour in butter. Add a very little flour, sweet herbs, a few mushrooms, trimmings, pepper and salt, quantity sufficient enough to moisten with some very good gravy or stock. Let the sauce boil, then strain it and carefully lay your olives in it to simmer till done and ready to be served. The sauce should then cover them in the saucepan. The sweet stuff. Mousseline pudding. Four ounces of pounded sugar. Four ounces of fresh butter. The rind of one lemon and the juice of two. With the yolks of ten eggs. To be mixed together in a saucepan and stirred on a slow fire until quite hot. Then strain the mixture into a basin and amalgamate lightly with it as you would for a souffle, the whites of the eggs whisked into a stiff froth. Pour into a well-buttered mould and steam for 20 minutes. Serve with jam sauce under apricot or red currant jelly. The water should boil when the pudding is put in to steam, but, but on no account after. Riz à la impatrice. Boil three tablespoonfuls of rice picked and washed clean in a pint of milk with sugar to taste and a piece of vanilla. When quite done, put it in a basin to get cold. Make a custard with a gill of milk and the yolks of four eggs. When cold, mix it with the rice. Beat up with a froth, a gill of cream with some sugar and a pinch of, of glass dissolved into a little water. Mix this very lightly with the rice and custard. Fill a mould with the mixture and set it on ice. When moderately iced, turn it out and serve it with any cold jam sauce or a sweet salad of fruits around it such as strawberries. Kitchen advice. An easy recipe for any salad. Salt, sugar, cayenne, pepper and mustard according to taste. Add three salt spoonfuls of oil and only one of vinegar. Add three or four leaves of tarragon or mint. Advertisement. Wanted. On the 3rd of July, two good servants, a plain cook and a housemaid. The cook to assist in the housework and the housemaid to help clean the boots. Knives cleaned by machine. 
only small things washed at home, wages to cook, fourteen pounds and all found, and to the housemaid, twelve pounds and all found. Not less than twelve months' character from the last place received, no Irish need apply. Address Queen's Office, 346 Strand, London. For some time, the United States and Great Britain's international relations were in strife. This was a cause of great concern to many in England. News of the Treaty of Washington, which restored relations between the two countries, was met with a great joy here in England, as we can hear in this news article, which was one of many. From the Queen on the 3rd of June, 1871. American News. General Grant, President of the American Republic. News bearing date of May 21st brings information about the Treaty of Washington concluded by the Joint High Commission, as it is termed, and it will be ratified by the American Senate and probably without any changes or amendments. This settlement of all the long standing grievances between America and England appears to be hailed with great satisfaction by the Americans, and it is considered as a fortunate occurrence for the President of the United States, General Grant, insomuch as the prestige he, in he acquires by this long-desired termination of vexatious and dangerous subjects of difference between the two countries is very likely to favourably influence his chances of re-election to the presidency in 1872. However, the event may prove to be General Grant's name must be inscribed in the annals of his country in honourable connection with two of the greatest events which have hitherto illustrated them. The termination of the war between the northern and southern states and the ratification of the Treaty of Washington. The second event though not of a character to cause much stir in the world, lay yet prove to be of great importance in its ultimate consequence. Tattle Tales Gossip Corner Looking at a range of gossip stories consuming the public of 1871. In Victorian times, a promise of marriage was not easily retractable. If a man broke his word after promising to marry, the woman in question could take the man to court and extract a high financial reward. We include one such case here. From the Illustrated Police News, June 1871, Breach of Promise. In the bail court on Monday before Mr Justice Hannon and a special jury was tried the case of Cheverton versus Masterman, an action of breach of promise of marriage. The defendant pleaded a denial of the promise, that a reasonable time had not elapsed in which to perform the promise, and a special plea that the plaintiff's mother had not furnished a house for the marriage as agreed. The plaintiff, who was a young lady of about 23 years of age, was the daughter of parents who at the time of the alleged engagement resided at Petworth in Sussex and the defendant resided at Bournemouth. In 1866, she was employed in a drapery business at Bournemouth, of which the defendant was at the time the manager, but of which he was now the proprietor. The parties became engaged in that year and the engagement continued with a very slight intermission until 1869. During that time, some hundreds of letters passed between them, the young lady having in the meantime lived at Southampton, London and Petworth. The letters were of the usual loving and ridiculous character, and the course of love appeared to run smooth until October 1869, when in consequence of something which passed between the plaintiff and a young lady engaged to the defendant's brother, but which she said could not communicate to him before marriage. 
an estrangement took place between them on the ground, as the defendant alleged that it showed a want of confidence in him on her part. An action was then threatened, whereupon the defendant renewed his promise to marry her within twelve months. The plaintiff's mother promised to furnish a house for him. The defendant commenced writing a series of letters to the plaintiff, leading her to believe that if she persisted in his performing his promise, she would live a life of wretchedness and misery. She replied in one of her letters to him that he was a mean, cowardly fellow with not one spark of manly conduct about him, and that the more she thought of him, the more she was disgusted with him. The result was that the marriage did not take place, and this action was brought. At the conclusion of the plaintiff's case, the learned parties conferred, which resulted in a verdict being taken by consent for the plaintiff, the young lady of 23, damages of £150. That was worth approximately £22,000 in 2024. Children being lured away under false promises was all too familiar a story. In 1871, the age of consent was 12. It was raised to 13 in 1875. From the Exmouth Journal, May 1871, a shocking case of abduction. At the Thames Police Court, Samuel Matthias, aged 30 years, shipwright, was charged with abducting Rosetta Wellington, aged 13 years, from her home on the 18th of March, 1870, and seducing her. He was also charged with stealing from her a frock, a bedgown, a chemise, and earrings, the property of Thomas Mitchell, her stepfather. The evidence went to show that the prisoner persuaded the girl to leave her home on a promise that he would take her to his father's home in Woolwich and then have two rooms where they could live together as a brother and sister. By this means he had succeeded in decoying her into a common lodging house in Woolwich, where they had lived and slept together until the 23rd of last month, when he abandoned her, having first deprived her of the clothes above mentioned. She found her way back in a miserable plight to her mother's house, and the prisoner was shortly after captured. No defence was offered, and Mr. Lushington committed him for trial at the next Middlesex session. As more people were educated and able to read, shifts were gradually taking place regarding the privileged ruling classes. This story, regarding the bad behaviour of a nobleman, was brought up in the Houses of Parliament session. From the Sun and Central Press, May 1871, charges against Sir John Ord, Bart. Mr McLaren asked the Home Secretary whether his attention had been called to a statement in the newspapers that Sir John Ord Bart of Kilmory was charged at the instance of the Proculator Fiscal of Argyle with an assault upon a boy four years old. While driving tandem along the public road, it appeared from evidence the baronet, while proceeding at a smart rate, struck with his whip at some children who were standing by the wayside and did nothing to provoke him, that the lash caught around the neck of the boy who was pulled to the ground and dragged several yards along the rough road, receiving cuts and bruises thereby on the head and neck, that Sir John's groom swore his master struck at the boy quite gratuitously, and when told he had lassoed a child by the throat, he gave a mocking laugh that several witnesses swore to seeing the boy dragged on the ground and that he did nothing to molest Sir John or his horses. Notwithstanding this evidence, the interim sheriff, Spears, acquitted Sir John, holding the occurrence to have been purely accidental, and whether he had instituted any inquiry into the administration of justice in the case. Bolton and Park 
The story that utterly engaged the public and that everyone talked about in 1871 was easily the Bolton and Park trial. Thomas Ernest Bolton, who, when in female mode, went by the name of Stella, and Frederick William Park, who went by the name of Fanny, were in the theatrics. They would sometimes dress up in women's clothing and walk along the fashionable areas freely. Their small theatrical troupe also, shockingly, involved an MP, similar to a congressman in the United States, Lord Arthur Clinton. He and Bolton were said to have a relationship in which Bolton went so far as to have cards printed calling himself Lady Arthur Clinton. Upon their arrest, they arrived at the police station still dressed in women's clothes. An excerpt of from what was considered a highly scandalous event in 1871 is below. From the Exmouth Journal, May 1871, the Bolton and Park prosecution. The case of the Queen versus Bolton and others came on in the Court of Queen's Bench before the Lord Chief Justice and a special jury on Tuesday last. This was the case of the men charged for wearing women's clothes in public places for improper purposes. The outline of the case for the prosecution was this. Some two or three years, certain persons alleged to have been some of the defendants, principally, it is said, Bolton and Park, had exhibited themselves at public places dressed sometimes as women and sometimes as men, and supposed by the police to be women. They were seen at the Alhambra, at the Surrey and Strand Theatres, and at the Casino in Holborn, in the Burlington Arcade, in Regent Street, in the Haymarket, and, and at the Oxford and Cambridge Boat Race. As early as 1867, Bolton was seen walking in the Haymarket with one of the defendants who had absconded, dressed in women's clothes and with a painted face. Disturbances ensued and some of the parties were taken before a magistrate and bound over to keep the peace. But again, they were seen at various places, at the Alhambra, for instance, where their conduct gave great offence and whence they were three or four times turned out. Nevertheless, they returned again and again, and so they were seen in the Burlington Arcade and where they was also turned out. They promenaded Regent Street and the Haymarket at night until the late hours in the morning and made acquaintances. Their headquarters appear to have been at 13 Wakefield Street, Regent Square, where they had an extensive wardrobe of female attire and female ornaments. In April 1870, a young gentleman named Mundell made their acquaintance at the Surrey Theatre and took them to be women. He was taken into custody with them and was one of the witnesses for the prosecution. The lodgings at Wakefield were searched and the female dresses were found, letters were discovered and inquiries were made which led to the present prosecution. Homosexual intimate relations were illegal at the time. However, the prosecution were unable to prove that this had taken place. There was no law statute against men wearing women's clothes in public or private, so the pair were free to go. They continued their theatrics and spent some time in the United States. We end this episode with this advert to travel holidays in 1871. Advertisement from the Banffshire Journal, the 30th of May, 1871. Wanted an appointment as a tutor in a family, the country preferred, by a student who has received a complete university education. Terms, £3 per month with board. Address, Aleph Banffshire Journal Office. That concludes this episode of Vintage Voices from 1871. We very much hope you enjoyed the show. We would be so grateful if you could like and subscribe to our channel. We upload three days a week. 
Tuesdays is our Vintage Voices series, including an Agony Aunt section, a Recipe section, and the Gossip of the Day. Thursdays is an episode looking at the lighter sides of Georgian, Victorian and Edwardian times. And Sundays with a recounting of stories by authors such as Dickens, Munro, Conan Doyle, M. R. James and Wilkie Collins. If you like this channel, you may like our sister channel, News of the Times, which looks at crime stories from the past. From all of us here at Chronicle of the Times, thank you for watching, liking and subscribing. This has been Chronicle of the Times, and I am Robin Coles.